A 58-year-old man, Moses Oyeleke, and a schoolgirl, Ndangiliya Ibrahim Umar, have been released from Boko Haram captivity and reunited with their families. The release was facilitated by two local non-governmental organizations, Khartoum Foundation for Peace and Initiative for Peace Building Movement, after weeks of negotiations and dialogue with the duo's abductors. While Oyeleke has been in captivity for seven months, Ndangiliya said she was held for nine months. Oyeleke a pastor with the Living Faith Church, Medugiri, was kidnapped alongside a core member, Abraham Amuta, in April 2019 on their way to Chibok local government area of Borno State with charity materials donated by the church. The core member, however, is yet to be released. Now, live with me uh, in the studio is uh, Reputation Manager Tubosu uh, uh, to make sense of this matter. How do you respond to this, even? Um, I think it's uh, good news. Um, I'm happy that um, they have been released and, uh, you know, I just think it's also very instructive um, to, to everyone that the uh, Boko Haram um, insurgent is still very, very formidable. Mm -hmm. As against um, the quick uh, victory that we had at some point where government said that they've been highly decimated. Um, and we shouldn't deny the truth. You know, we should not deny the fact. Um, I think that this particular situation, the method that has worked now, um, should be carefully looked at, and then we can see how we can replicate the success of mm -hmm. this method that has, you know, allowed them to release two people. And, I, I, and it, you know, it's very interesting because they released a pastor and they also released, uh, I mean, they released both male and female. Mm -hmm. And I believe but that it's a core member that's not released yet. Yes, and when I read um, the story that was, you know, published yesterday, the man did say that. I think he was arrested with his brother and they had said that they would try and also release him sometimes in December. Yeah. Um, while, you know, they claim that um, they didn't pay a dime, I want to believe that if there was a negotiation, there definitely has been some trade-off. Um, the risk of the trade-off um, is what we also need to be very careful of yeah. so that we are not further reinforcing and empowering um, the insurgent. And um, if there are ways that uh, we can continue to also pursue this path so that we can get the release of other people like, you know, the remaining of the Chibok girls and uh, Leah, um, you know, it will be, it will be a, a major, a massive victory for this government and for the people of Nigeria and most importantly, the families of these people that the Boko Haram you know, have um, ad abducted. Mm -hmm. uh, more also, very importantly, is for the government to sit up and, you know, put measures in place to ensure and reduce, you know, this kidnapping and the security issue across, mm -hmm. you know, the country. Um, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's a major, major issue and no society can enjoy um, a lot of development when security is, you know, um, is, is, compromised. Is, is compromised. Yeah. Yes. Okay, having said that, it brings me to my second question. You and I would agree that this is uh, the shortest um, or fastest release we've seen so far in terms of uh, the kidnapping. It's less than a year. We're not saying that it should be the norm. Now, having said that they had negotiations and dialogue, does that put a face to these so-called people? Uh, um, so, I mean, if we're going by basic local knowledge, most of the time you always almost know the troublemakers around your areas. Correct. Most of the time, if you know you have little intelligence skills here and there, or you are abreast of what is happening, um, the locals will definitely have an idea of those people who belong to the Boko Haram group in that area. So, I think that the Boko Haram has always had a face. Yeah. They've always been a bit reachable. What has just happened is that they have people, I mean, a lot of people have, con because of how the situation has progressed or deteriorated over the years, it has become important for people to, the value of knowing them has become so important that people are keeping it to themselves. Yeah. So there are journalists who have access to them but cannot break the trust of that access, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Um, there are, um, there are um, you know, um, NGOs like the ones who have negotiated who have access to them and cannot break that trust because if you break the trust, then you will not be able to make progressive or, you know, 
beneficial use of you know having access to them, to them. Um, um, subsequently so they've always had a face okay having said that you know we've always seen these issues of ngos being attacked and all that even like in this case uh, they were kidnapped on their way to go uh, donate uh, relief materials yeah. would that be is that an issue you know how do we get protection or be assured that even the ngos who are trying to make it easy are safe and protected you see, security issues are not, uh, no one is completely isolated when you have security threats. So in, uh, during the 9-11 issue in America, at some point you would have thought that, oh, the terrorists were only going to you know, face America. Uh -huh. But look at it today, you know, the influence has spread across you know, the whole world. Um, you, if you have security issues anywhere, it could make it look like, oh, some people were the main target of it. But before you know it, it just start to spread to every other person around there. So um, if, if, and you're not dealing in, I mean, some people say in war, you know, everything is okay. So it's a war situation. They can't trust anybody. Maybe you are bringing them help or you're not bringing them help. You know, the security threat is it's there. Nothing can completely insulate you from the threat unless... Um, you um, um, you solve that security problem. I haven't said that. I think that government also has to put enough security measures and procedures in place uh -huh. so that there is almost a recognized approach to how you know help is delivered to this area. Because <clears throat> to an extent, to they also even the insurgents find a way to take advantage of some of these helps when they sure. come. You know, so um, and sometimes they suspect that the people bringing the help are, you know, security forces or intelligence people, and then sometimes they attack. Sometimes they use it as leverage to continue to perpetrate the evil that, you know, they want to. So um, I think what is important is to for government to put enough security procedures and processes in place to ensure that either, you know, um, you know the help that is moving to these troubled areas are moved in bulk and well secured and you know people are not just you know doing it on their own so maybe once a week i mean the procedures uh -huh. are there the security operators you know how to put the procedures in place to ensure that people are secured when they are going to the drive and then we don't continue because every time there's this kidnap and all of that the negotiation will all you know someone always has to bend uh -huh. you know and in the, in the process yeah ground. you have to come to a compromise you have to come to a middle ground and the process of doing that you might actually you know for that be empowering the incident.